It was 120 masonite huts, three administration buildings, and that was all. We just on that barren spot. We understood that we were the first black Marines, and we were paving the way for somebody behind us. So that's why we were so determined to just succeed. I have enormous pride in having been an officer in the Marine Corps. Though I felt kind of funny when I was assigned to blacks, I have a very good feeling about the experience I had there. We're marching, we're marching up to Zion. We're marching, we're marching up to Zion. We're marching, up to Zion. we're marching up to Zion. Oh, give his name the praise. Hallelujah, marching, marching up the King. Sing over there. This nation was founded by men of many nations and backgrounds. It was founded on the principle that all men are created equal, and that the rights of every man are diminished when the rights of one man are threatened. If the Negro is to be free, he must move down into the inner resources of his own soul and sign with the pen and ink of self-asserted manhood. When you look back at African Americans, the black people have been involved since the very beginning of this country. The very first blood was shed during the American Revolution by Crispus Attucks on the Boston Square in 1770. Black American Marines are documented as far back as 1776, where John Martin, a Delaware slave, who was recruited without his owner's permission by Captain of the Marines, Miles Pennington, of the Continental Brig USS Reprisal. Martin was given the role as the first black Marine. At least 12 other black men served in U.S. Marine units between 1776 and 1777 in the American Revolutionary War. From 1798 to 1942, the Marine Corps denied African Americans the opportunity to serve as Marines. The black people knew that we could fight. We knew our history. And so we began to petition through the NAACP, uh, the Urban League, a few major uh, black media began to petition our government for the right to fight for this country. President Franklin D. Roosevelt, after meeting in September 1940 with a panel of black leaders, offered African Americans better treatment and greater opportunity within the segregated armed forces in return for their support of his rearmament program and his attempt to gain an unprecedented third term in the November election. Mrs. Roosevelt probably was approached by another woman, uh, Mary McLeod Bethune, the founder of Bethune Cookman College from Florida, it is known that those two women were friends. She and Mrs. Bethune pressured him into the idea which he finally swallowed reluctantly and signed the presidential order, which said that no matter whether you are Asian or black or what, American, whatever, you could be accepted into the 98th Marine Corps. During the past year, Negroes came into the Corps for the first time. They never told us that we we're going to a separate boot camp. Never mentioned anything about it until when we got to Mount Clinton Camp. That's when we found out that we weren't going to San Diego or we were not going to Paris Island. I said, I've read everything they ever printed about the Marine Corps. I know, he said, where, where will you be going? I'll be going to Paris Island, South Carolina. And the corporal said, you are not going to Paris Island, South Carolina. Now I am stuck. Somebody hit me in the head with a hammer. Why? He said, because 
the governor of South Carolina has declared that people like you are not coming there. You know, in, um, in, in 1942, uh, at Mindful Point Camp, down in the backwoods, I mean the backwoods of Camp Lejeune, um, where they were hidden, uh, because everybody expected that, you know, they'll go through this stuff, they'll, they'll, they'll quit, uh, they won't stick it out, and yet they did, and they kept coming. Those Marines did everything that the white Marines did, whether it was segregated camps or, or whatever, they were not going to be denied the title of United States Marine. Between 1942 and 1949, roughly 20,000 uh, African Americans decided to enlist. At that time, uh, the Marine Corps was not uh, integrated with minorities. This was at a time when their sacrifices were not truly appreciated, when the color of their skin mattered more than their courage and dedication. These African Americans, coming from every state in the Union, were not sent to the traditional boot camps of Paris Island, South Carolina, and San Diego, California. Instead, African American Marine recruits were segregated and assigned to basic training at Montford Point, a newly established site at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. The further south I had ever been was Jersey City, so I didn't know where North Carolina was or anything else. When we came into camp that day, we had a truckload of us, and the first thing I remember that was they had a platoon out there drilling, and they stopped, and they was at parade rest, and they was taking a break, and all of them started hollering, you're going to be sorry. You're going to be sorry. You're going to be sorry, because we just laughing and didn't know really what they was talking about. The Marine Corps basically, in the early days, were looking for the best black men that they could find. The first men that came in who had their degrees, we call them the mighty platoon, were anywhere between eight to 10 years older than the average black recruit that was coming in 18, 19 years old. I was in the first platoon and uh, five of us came in from Washington, D.C. One of the guys was, he looked like he was about 29 found out later that this guy had been a lieutenant in the army. He resigned his commission and came in under a private in the Marine Corps. Conditions were less than hospitable, dilapidated, prefabricated huts from a Depression-era Civilian Conservation Corps unit initially served as barracks. We had uh, green huts made out of cardboard that used to use for, for bulletin boards painted. And we had a pot belly stove inside. We got one skull but a coal night. And I don't know how many, it seemed like it was 12 or 13, I guess it was 13 of us in that hut. It wasn't any humane, but it was rough. People look at me like I'm exaggerating when I say rattler were everywhere. And I've been, we were right in the midst of all of that stuff. The two groups that came in, those from the south and those from the north, uh, felt as though they were strangers getting used to each other. A lot of the, the, the shortcomings that people may just have institutionally, and it's not their fault. Um, you know, that someone grew up in upstate New York, they're gonna think differently than someone who grew up in, you know, down the river Alabama or Mississippi. Um, it's different. And that was an amazing thing too. And up here in north, you had to be a high school graduate to join the Marines. When we got there, we found men uh, that they had their name written two feet tall, they couldn't read it. My first job was to teach reading and writing because at that time, we had a lot of young men, or a lot of men who had fought in World War II, who were sergeants, corporals, but they couldn't read, they couldn't write. They saw that the, the, these northern, northern blacks uh, were, how shall I put it? I think they saw that they thought the, the northern blacks were like white people rather than black because of uh, their education and the way they behaved. 
I had been introduced to segregation as a young six and seven year old. I, I knew about segregation, but most of those guys didn't know nothing about it. And they were saying, well, why are they doing this? And I said, well, this is just the way it is. And you'd have to get used to it. And then they would question me about, you know, what should they do? And I said, there's nothing that you could do. We got on the train and we were playing and having a good time. Then when we got to Washington, D.C., the Pullman Porter came in and he says, you five guys come with me. I said, where are we going? He said, you have crossed the Mason-Dixon line. Well, it didn't mean anything to me. I didn't know what the Mason-Dixon line was. Had, uh, we knew that we, there were prejudice, but we didn't know what it was called. It, it floored me because I really had never experienced anything like that. Jacksonville, North Carolina, when I was there, I was 43, when we first went, uh, we was disliked by the whites and the blacks. We just wasn't liked at all. You could go to a restaurant and say, uh, they didn't want to serve you. Uh, I'm talking about black restaurants, they want to serve, and the whites was not going to serve us. Even the little kids would want to spit on you, and the dogs would growl at you. But at first now, First, it was just as bad on the base as it was in town. I was in the fire department, and in order for us to go to main site, we had to get a pass. You had to get a pass. And being that we were in the fire department, we had to go to their fire department to get our supplies. And they had a dog, and they called him such and such. And the dog ran out, and I grabbed a spanner wrench, and I was going to hit this dog with the spanner wrench, and the guy said, you hit him, I'm going to take you in the back, and I'm going to hang you. So I said, man, look, you can have this base and everything else. Maybe before uh, the last part of 1943, they had a, a, a big forest fire down there near Jacksonville, North Carolina, and uh, they asked for volunteers and asked us would we go and help them fight at the forest fire and some of us volunteered and we went and we felt like we saved the town. The town thought that we saved them too and I guess we did. But we could see the attitude from them changing from that moment on. They had one the meanest bunch of MPs down in Jacksonville, North Carolina, I think it was ever the Marine Corps. And they let us know what was gonna happen the first time we took some out on Liberty. They were going to take their, pull their uniforms off of them and run them in for being out of uniform. Word came down from the Commandant of the Marine Corps. Uh, Colonel Wood called him. Forest Marshal and everybody knew around there what was going to happen. They started messing up his Marines, and that put a stop there. So they came up with Colonel Wood as the commanding officer. I think they had searched the Marine Corps over just about it. He was a graduate of the Citadel, Colonel Woods was. A fair man as you ever seen. He was everything that you were looking for, and he let you know it too. After they got to where they were going on Liberty, we would go out on weekends, the Colonel would send us out as weekends as MPs. And if any of the boys got into trouble, then we brought them back in, and Colonel Woods punished them. He was checking on the black marines. He was checking to see that everybody was treating black marines as marines instead of colored guys. Um, so they, they had white officers and white NCOs, staff NCOs initially, until they trained their own. Tune sergeant, old gunny sergeant Ball, came to us and told us, he says, fellas, they're starting a new outfit. Best thing in the world you two can do is volunteer and go to it. And we went to Montford Point. We got over there and got to find out we were going to be drill instructors for colored guys. My drill instructor, he was a Black Angel of Peleroo. I don't know if any of you ever heard about this. But he was the one that told us that if you're going to be a Black Marine, you're going to have to be better than anybody else. Better. I had an opportunity to be the commanding officer at uh, Camp Johnson, which was the home of the original Montford Point Marines. I really didn't realize until I got there how important it was 
for me to be as good as I could be because they fought for the right to fight. It was like they didn't want us. They did everything to try to discourage us. You need to go home, you don't need to be here, and they'd call you all kind of bad names, and they'd talk about your parents. And it, it really, really, there were a couple of days there that I cried that night. I, I guess the first time, the first thing, it was doing right, right, face right. But this, this was a black instructor now. The drill instructor came down and asked me, what are you supposed to be doing? And I said, dress right. He said, well, what are you doing looking at your fingers? I tried to start explaining that this is, your assistant told me. Next thing I knew, I was inside the barracks, through the wall, the little hut wall we had there at Marple Point, and I was inside of it. <laughs> well, the first couple of weeks was pure hell, <laughs> because they said it was hell for us, and it's going to be for hell for you guys. If you want to be a Marine, we're going to show you that you're going to have to sacrifice. I don't remember or recall uh, anybody dropping out. Uh, I know that a test was made, uh, so I was told, uh, of a few men and one of the first men to come in and believe his name was Huff. John Wayne couldn't have beat Huff. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Huff was a good man. He was strong, big, and loved the Marine Corps. Okay, and he took the Marine Corps at heart. Huff was uh, about twice the size of Hashmark. And Huff was a big guy. And whereas Hashmark would issue uh, stern and disciplinary kinds of uh, orders, Huff would uh, walk up to you softly and knock you on the, on the deck if you didn't comply. And Hashmark Johnson had already served about close to 20 years in the Navy and the Army. That's why they call him Hashmark. He was the only Negro that had Hashmarks. But those couple of Hashmarks were, became painful to him. He also had on the side of his head, which he didn't hesitate to show you, two very bad gashes that were healed up. They were the clubs of white MPs in Jacksonville, North Carolina, who asked him where did he get these stripes? How come you Negroes have just gotten in the Marine Corps? How could you have possibly earned, you must be out of uniform? He tried to explain to them, those were given to him in the Army and the, and the Marine Corps allowed him to have them legally and wear them. And that's the nickname, Hashmark Johnson, because of the two hash marks on his forehead, not because of these two here, but the hash marks on his forehead from the club of a white MT in Jacksonville, North Carolina. And uh, Huff was his buddy. They were good buddies because they were from the same state. And that's, so Hashmark kind of brought Huff along because they were buddies. Matter of fact, they wound up marrying two sisters. He and his brother-in-law were the two top people in the Black Marine Corps at, at Lajeu, at, uh, at Montfort Point. Two people to be feared very, very much. You will go to see Sergeant Major Hashmark Johnson. Remember, call him Hashmark. We said, okay. So we went to the ad building, we walked in, and there was his clerk was named Hill. And Hill told us, that's Sergeant Major's office right there. So we went in, and there was nobody in there. And Oscar Lee Flo Jr. sat in Sergeant Major Johnson's desk in his chair. And we stood around the rest of the room. Sergeant Major came in, he looked up and he saw a flow in his chair. And all at once I knew that I was in the wrong place. Cause that man said some curse words I never heard of. That man was so mad, he grabbed Flo and threw Flo out of the chair against the wall and he told us to stand at attention. And I knew then and there I'd made a mistake. I know I, I need to be in the Army or in the Navy somewhere. I surely didn't need to be in this. They were going to see to it that you black Marines will not let us down 
you will have the same backbone. When we're finished with you, either you will have the same backbone that we have or you won't have any backbone. And so the training was unusually cruel, unusually hard. They were who they were, I want to put it that way. They had the power, they did things, but uh, that's the way it was in those days. They were the first to be selected because at the beginning of the thing, it was all white drill and stuff. I met Frederick Branch on several occasions, but I always look at the photograph of Fred receiving his uh, second lieutenant commission, the big smile on his face and his lovely lady beside him. Quite often, uh, the one who finally made it through was not really the one who was, who was the first to try. There had many, who, there, not say many, there had some who had gone before Fred, but none of them had made it through the officer's training. Fred was the first one to go through and, and make it all the way. He was promoted second lieutenant and put into the reserve the next day and sent back to Philadelphia because they didn't have any place for him. Uh, I have a pretty good idea what Fred went through, but I have no idea what his personal experiences were. Given the times, I just have to assume that Fred caught hell. I am very proud to say that everything I have been able to do, I, I have been able to do because of people like them who went through the first real crucible. After completing arduous and segregated basic training at Montford Point, North Carolina, these Marines served with honor during a critical period in our nation's history. We actually had six Montford Point Marines come to Paris Island and one of them reviewed a parade. These are guys who were not allowed to walk across the parade deck at Paris Island. They created a legacy for every Marine. I mean, it doesn't matter what nationality you are. They created that legacy because if you see what they went through, they never gave up. Everybody figured, well, they're not going to be in the Marine Corps that long and uh, we don't want them here in the first place. But through the initiative of sticking and staying, uh, we've kind of pushed our way in. And uh, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. And when I told the folks who were there who these men were, I didn't even have to explain, you know, what their lives had been like. They got a standing ovation. Our country gets it. They get it. So they created a legacy of Marines, and they paved the way for Marines like me. Once given the chance to prove themselves, it became impossible to deny the fact that African-American Marines were just as capable as all other Marines, regardless of race, color, creed, or national origin. And the white Marines had run out of ammunition. They were totally encircled by the Japanese. Colbert Blair, he stated, number one, when they brought the ammunition into that surrounded white company of infantry and Marines, they were praising them and saying, where you guys come from? They called them the Black Angels of Pelabu. We was not supposed to be fighting outfits uh, on Guam and on Saipan. Japanese broke through and everybody became a fighter. When you experience something under duress, under combat conditions, and you know somebody else has, you all automatically have a little bond with them. One of them was telling me about how they would go up to the front and bring the wounded back, take ammo up and bring the wounded back and sometimes they had to fight their way up there to get back. And they, they really, the guys, the Marines, the white Marines gave them respect. When they get in these kind of, any kind of areas where there's death involved, there's brotherhood, believe me. There's brotherhood. And color goes out the window. They had ammo taking it up. And of course you got to, there was barriers coming back, so you ducking without shooting, so they, 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 you know, they were seeing what they were really going through. And uh, some of them came out, some of them didn't. Monfort Point Marines served in some of the bloodiest struggles in the Pacific. Saipan, Guam, 
Tienian, Pilelu, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa. Some died in these battles. Many others continued their service in Korea and Vietnam. These Montford Pointers and the ones who have passed are equally as important to the history of the Marine Corps as the Tuskegee Airmen are to the Air Force and the Buffalo Soldiers are to the United States Army. As such, we are working aggressively with the legislators on Capitol Hill to confer the Congressional Gold Medal this year on the Montford Point Marines for their service to the United States from World War II to the Vietnam era, forever anchoring their role in the history of our nation's great military. Regardless of, of, of your background, be you Hispanic, American Indian, African American, whatever, that uh, you can find role models, people who have come from different backgrounds, and role models help to inspire you. I, I am because they were, and uh, you know, God, God bless them. I mean, they, they had to fight for the right to fight. In 1944, General Alexander Vandegrift, then Commandant, Medal of Honor recipient and hero of Guadalcanal, who had observed the courage of black Marines in hand-to-hand -hand combat on the island of Saipan, made this famous statement. The experiment with Negro Marines is over. They're Marines, period. Collectively, Montford Point Marines paved the way for the many thousands of Marines of African American heritage, men and women alike, who serve our nation today with honor, courage, and commitment. H.R. 2447, a bill to grant the Congressional Gold Medal to the Montford Point Marines. On this vote, the yeas are 422, the nays are zero. Two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended, the bill is passed. The Congressional Gold Medal is the highest civilian honor that Congress can bestow. Working with the Monfort Point Marines, as with, with any recipient of a gold medal, we're very sensitive to what, how they want to be portrayed and how they don't want to be portrayed. And I wanted to show the average soldier, I didn't want it heroic with their fe facial features. I wanted them to look like the everyday guy that enlisted for World War II. So we're always trying to, to make that person look regal and, and you know, show that they deserve this medal because they do, obviously. I think it's, just, it's an honor for them. And we really just want to make them proud and show them that we're proud of their service. That was the main thing. I am so happy to see that they are finally being rewarded for that sacrifice and their service to our core and to our nation. This was one of the most bipartisan issues that we had. Everybody worked together to honor you Moffett Point Marines. To these American heroes, to your families, we owe an incredible deal of gratitude. The Congressional Gold Medal is but a small token of appreciation that you deserve. On 27 June 2012, Congress conferred the nation's highest civilian award, the Congressional Gold Medal, on the Montford Point Marines. We, we deserve our place. You know, our history is good. It deserves more than a, a footnote at the end of the chapter. And these officers are giving us that chapter. This is history that should be taught. This is, is history uh, that should be uh, glorified. These men were heroes. These men were the first African-Americans to step up. And this day, above all others in my life, is the crowning glory. I really appreciate what has happened. It's the, one of the best days of my life. And I'm really proud to be a Marine. And they proved that the content of their character, their desire to serve their country, and their patriotism transcend the color line.
without you serving, without you taking the initiative, without you putting yourself in the positions that you did, um, I would not be here today. I stand here today because once upon a time, there were giants that walked this country. These were men who were giants not because of their stature, but because of their comportment. These were giants because of their honor, integrity, and impeccable character. They were giants because of their resolve, their vigilance, and their commitment to a country that had not yet committed to them. God only gave you so much time. And if you don't see it or do it, it's gone. I have seen it and I'm glad.